will move on to the next item in our agenda, and that is the case law review. So if my wonderful colleagues will come up as I call up their names and we can hold their applause until they're all seated. Um, Aliza Velmans, um, she's a senior associate in our commercial property and litigation department. Aliza, you can come up on stage. Thanks. So she will be talking um, about all about her topic is oil giant gets blown out of the wild coast waters. Mm -hmm. uh, she'll be followed by Alicia Cabini. Alicia is a partner in our trademark litigation. Come up, Alicia, looking at you in our trademark litigation department. And um, anyone for Polo, that's going to be interesting. Uh, thereafter, followed by Yanni Cronier. Yanni will be addressing the hippo in the room. Mm. Okay, um, and Verena, where are you? I thought I saw her just now. Okay, Verena will be talking about copyright and a recent decision that has come up out of the courts. Um, Darren will also join the panel. It's just getting mic'd up. Um, and he will be looking at Not So Good for the Soul, a really highly publicized um, case I'm sure you've come across um, that has come through the courts. In fact, three of them. Okay, so I will now hand over to Aliza. Over to you. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone, and um, thank you for joining us in this case law discussion. <laughs> See if it works. Not going yet. There we go. So the shell case um, deals with Oyen Gels, a giant shell, which made headlines for quite a few weeks when demonstrators outside of High Court demonstrated in support of a legal giant David and Goliath battle. If you're anything like me, maybe you wondered, what is this whole shell case about? So for the next 10 to 15 minutes, I hope to explain to you what this case is about. How did we get here? Why is this case important? And what can corporations learn from this case and take into the future? So what is this entire thing about? Um, you'll see this is the illustration of a seismic survey. And in a brief moment, I'll explain the detail of it. But Shell planned a seismic survey off the wild coast in the Eastern Cape. And for those that you that don't know, the wild coast is a beautiful 300 kilometer stretch of coast that boasts in a, an extreme biodiversity, marine, wildlife, bird life, and also natural reserves. And Shell planned the seismic survey at that wild coast. And as Judge Mbenge in this uh, judgment said, while some enjoy water sports on the beaches comprising the eastern coast, it is to others a home for communities that are steeped in customary rituals. These communities subsist on fishing and other marine resources to supplement their livelihood. So Shell entered this sphere and wanted to do their seismic survey. And a seismic survey is basically a ship coasting along the surface of the ocean, sending down sound waves to the seabed. These sound waves are dispatched every 10 seconds for five months at 250,000 decibels. It is bounced back to receivers that stretch about six kilometers long. So I want you to think about that scale for a moment and the time for a moment. And this is what the communities resisted in that in this case. They said that these loud sound waves will impact the marine life severely. Their migration habits, their feeding habits, which is a significant thing to think about. So let's just take a recap. Let's talk about the litigation. How did we get here and where are we? So back in 2014, Shell was granted an exploration right. In 2021, they renewed their right 
and announced that they will start with a seismic survey. Naturally, this was met with strong resistance, with protesters not only in South Africa, but also in London and Amsterdam at Shell's head office. And then what followed was two interdict applications, the first being unsuccessful and the second being successful. So on 17 December 2021, the interdict urgent interim interdict was granted. And let me just briefly explain what the applicants held in that 17 December 2021 hearing. They said firstly that the applicants in that case were not consulted at all in this granting of the rights. Second, they said that this planned seismic survey will cause irreparable harm, not only to the marine environment, but it will impact the livelihood of local fisher communities, their customary rights, as well as their constitutional rights. Thirdly, they say that this area in which the survey is planned enjoys specific legal protection because it has a very high ecological value. And lastly, they say the minister, when granting this right, did not consider what impact this seismic survey will have on climate change, as well as South Africa's commitments to climate change. So after this, Inter interim interdict granted, Shell was stopped from doing their seismic survey. And then the case took a step further and the interim inter uh, the interdict was taken a step further and the review application was heard. And in 1 September 2021, the court declared this granting of the right unlawful and it was reviewed and set aside. But now, NGOs and communities are gearing back to go back to court because Shell and Minister M Mantashe appealed to the Supreme Court of Appeal in Bloemfontein. So now that you know the background and the, the gist of what this case is about, why is it important? This is a nominal step. It's a, it's a victory for social and environmental justice. The courts were reluctant in the past to grant such rights like culture, language, religion, strong legal rights, strong legal protection. But yeah, the court set precedent. It actually steps up and says, yes, these rights require strong legal protection. And out of a social justice perspective, in the past, local fishermen that had no access to courts, they have their voices heard. They could explain why is this important? Just as a brief explanation, um, the local communities in this area, they have a strong religious connection to the ocean. They believe that their ancestors um, <coughs> reside in the ocean and it is dear to them and near to them. Also, it highlights the importance of consultation. But I need to stand still here, not just consultation, but meaningful consultation. When big companies consult with local communities, it must be culturally appropriate, consensus driven and purposeful. And then lastly, I do think corporations can learn from this case. It's important to stand still and really consider this judgment and understand what it would mean for a corporation going forward. So, key take home points. What can corporations do when matters like this arise in the future? So it is an unfortunate reality that South Africa relies heavily on oil and gas for energy needs. And some might argue that discovering oil and gas off the coast in, at the wild coast might mean South Africa's independence for energy needs. But unfortunately, that is inconsistent with the global movement for zero carbon emission future. So it takes some thinking. It takes some considerations for corporates. Um, I believe that corporates can, can learn from this decision in three ways. Um, there must be a commitment to promote sustainable development and to look after the environment, but also take the eco economy forward. 
And this requires that corporates consult with the local communities to really understand what rights will be impacted and to find mitigative steps if there will be infringement in future. Let me explain where Shell got it completely wrong. Um, so notice was given in a language that not everyone in the local communities could understand. And also notice was given on a website. So for a local fisherman without internet access, they did not know about this. So in future, corporates can learn from that. Produce it in a way that everyone, the local fishermen, can understand what will happen in their local community. Give them opportunity to bring their thoughts to the table, to consult, to bring ideas. They want to bring ideas. Just give them an opportunity to speak. Had Shell consulted with these local communities, they would have understood not only the customary fishing rights that will be impacted, but also the constitutional rights that will be impacted and then to take mitigative steps against that. And then I also think that corporates must budget to ensure that there is compliance and to lessen the risk of legal intervention down the line. All corporates must ensure that they have the necessary authorizations because I don't think it serves anyone if you are granted a right which is later overturned by a court. It is very expensive and there are ways to take steps before it reaches the court. And that's why I want to leave you with this thought. Is it really a win if you go and win in court? Why I'm saying that is it's we have this delicate balance in our government between the three spheres, the legislature, the executive, um, and the judiciary. And if the judiciary is called upon to influence the decisions of the executive, it is expensive and it is a tiring task. And I think if corporates, as well as ministers, take their time to make sure that each step is lawful and is taking everything into consideration, we don't need to reach the court. So in conclusion, I want to just, <laughs> and this is a very environmental friendly uh, picture, but <laughs> this ruling is proof that our world is moving in a new direction. We're moving <laughs> into an era of social and environmental justice, where courts are more inclined than ever to grant these social and environmental rights the legal protection that is required. Thank you, guys. Thanks very much, Eliza. Just want to check if there are any questions for Eliza in the room. Guys, the roaming mic is not being used. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no questions in the room. Anything in the chat, Lindy? Is there? Okay, can you? How can clients be insured considering that there is that is a long question, but it's a good question. Let me just check. I can repeat the question quickly just to I think so. um, explain what I heard and then maybe just yes. tell me if I got it. Okay. Um, so Timby asked whether, I okay, guess, so the, the point of consultation, it is, I think she said it's broad and there's no strict um, rules about consultation and how can, like, how can you ensure compliance with consultation? Question. Yes. Okay, so I've got it here. You mentioned that meaningful consultation is vital. How can compliance be ensured considering that there is not one set of rules that apply throughout South African communities? That is a very good question. Um, and naturally, it is a case to case basis that you need to consider. I mean, every community has their own uh, religious and cultural beliefs. But the basic is basically consult. So in other words, make sure people have noticed so that they understand what rights will be infringed or what will happen, and then give them a platform to bring their points and their thoughts. Um, so in other words, it's literally getting people in a room to talk. Um, in this case, for example, just to explain that as well, the consultation was with three big monarchs in um, this area, which is not representative of the communities mm. make sure that the consultation is representative of the local communities thanks eliza um and then i have one question you spoke about uh two interim interdicts i think i mean after the first one you know you think that you're done what's the <laughs> difference between the two 
yeah, that's also a very good question. Um, so the the first interdict was with recreational and bigger corp, uh, fisheries. So in other words, they were they were aware of the right being granted to Shell and that the exploration rights will continue. Um, but obviously, it was just about the nature of the consultation and if it was adequate or not. But the second interdict application was brought by local fisheries. Mm. So the, the man on the street, the man on the beach um, fishing. And uh, also, they brought evidence of 10 experts. So, I mean, it goes without a shadow of a doubt that when I mean, 10 experts agree that it will bring about irreparable harm, that it will. Okay. I think that's... I think that five minutes is up now. Um, I know I've got one more question for you, Lisa, but I think we can go back to it. I am keen to move on um, on to Alicia now. So Alicia, over to you. Over to me, if I can work out the clicker. <laughs> no, <laughs> click, click. I'm trying. <laughs> no, <laughs> you click, maybe you've maybe. got the magic touch. Maybe yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well done. The green one. Okay, so while Elisa's trying to save the animals, the community, the whales, we're going to try and save the horses. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try and summarize for you guys in about the next 15 minutes, 111 pages of judgment that was handed down by the Supreme Court of Appeal on the 22nd of February. Um, Elisa asked the question, is it always good to go to court? In this instance, yes, it was good. We won. It was great. <laughs> Um, so on the 22nd of February 2022, the SCA handed down judgment validating the polo trademarks and finding that they have become firmly established in South Africa. So now you must be wondering, what was this matter about? Why were we in court? And why would the court say that the polo trademarks have become firmly established in South Africa? Basically, this was a dispute between two competitors. It was about a fight for the polo trademarks between LA Group who we can call Polo South Africa and Stable Brands, who is the exclusive licensee of the United States Polo Association. Somewhere in, April, in May 2018, LA Group learned that Stable Brands was coming into the market with a T-shirt or shirts that have a horse on it. Ooh, we were very, very, very concerned. Um, LA Group then brought an application to the High Court for an interim interdict to prevent the sale of these goods. In response to that application, stable brands did the best thing you can always do. When you're in a bad position, attack. <laughs> so they brought an application with a counter, a counter application for the removal of 46 of Polar South Africa's trademark registration. So all of a sudden, we were in a slight bit of trouble. That application, together with Alec Group's application for an interim interdict, was set down for hearing in November 2018. For reasons not relevant, the application for an interim interdict was withdrawn, and the only application argued on that day, or over two or three days, in fact, was the application for the removal of Polar South Africa's 46 trademark registrations. Now we're saying, right, so on what basis can you possibly attack the Polar South Africa's trademark registration? Um, just about everything. Um, Here's my slide for they threw everything but the kitchen sink at us. <laughs> so now we're going to discuss what the kitchen sink included. The registrations of the death on the basis of five sections in the Trademark Act. Let's go to the five sections. The first one is section 10 to 8. Basically, they argued that the Polo Trademark is not capable of distinguishing. This section often means that you can't register apples for apples. You can, of course, register apples for computers, but not for apples. The next section is that the trademark consisted of something that is an indication of quality, kind, type. You can't register the best by guys. No matter how good you think your product is best, to describe <laughs> it is not capable of distinguishing and will not be a trademark. The next one is that it was applied for removal on the basis that it become customary in trade. Basically, the trademark had become generic. So once upon a time, elevator, no, escalator used to be a trademark for moving stairs. Now, escalator is just the word we use for the stairs. The trademarks were then attacked on these three grounds. That's half the kitchen sink. It's not all of it. There's more. <laughs> then there's section 27. So the trademarks were also attacked on the basis that there had been no intention to use the trademarks and no use. In addition, that there had been no use of the trademarks for five years following five years after it's been registered. 
And the interesting part of this case is that the Polo trademarks had been used in a manner that could be likely to cause deception or confusion in the marketplace. That's the section we should all be on the lookout for is section 1013. So there we were before the High Court. And guess what the High Court did? The High Court removed all 46 Polo trademark registrations on all of the grounds relied on and refused leave to appeal. That's how we felt after having <laughs> received that decision. Not very happy chaps. So then we were down and out, but the skim said, you must stick the knock and move on. We then applied to the Supreme Court of Appeal for leave to appeal. The Supreme Court, once having granted our client leave to appeal, then heard the matter and found in our favor. They found in our favor by three judges to two. A win is a win, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to look at the same arguments that we raised prior and what the Supreme Court of Appeals held concerning these sections. As you will recall, the other side in this matter is stable brand. So basically, they argued that Polo was descriptive for goods falling into class 25, which includes clothing, for goods falling into class 9, that includes glasses, sunglasses, for goods falling into class 18, such as handbags, leather goods, whips, saddlery, for goods falling into class 28, that includes games and playthings. They further argued that Polo was indicative of a type or kind of good. Like Jenny always says, apparently in France, you call a shirt a pimpolo. That was their argument. And their final argument was that the word had become customary in the trade. Basically, in the same way as escalator, people were commonly referring to T-shirts, shirts, bags, sunglasses, polo. It sounds ridiculous. <laughs> but what they adduced in support of their arguments with dictionary definitions, obviously, polo is the game of polo. But in addition, they also had used evidence of the dictionary definition of a polo shirt, a polo neck, a polo coat. And then they said on the basis of these dictionary definitions, the word was incapable of distinguishing, not only in relation to clothing, although the dictionary definitions only talked about clothes, they expanded that to the other classes being 89, 25, and 28. They also put up evidence of the fashion industry being Zando. I was like, how's Zando the whole fashion industry? And then they also referred to the existence of other trademarks in the market to argue that because these other trademarks existed, Polo had become common in the trade. The other trademarks that they relied on was Santa Monica Polo Club. Now we're going to try my best. Tradicion de Polo Argentina La Matina. And they said on the basis of that, the trademark had become generic. Shock, horror, horror. The High Court and the Supreme Court of Appeal, the minority judgment, agreed with these arguments and held that the Polo trademark was generic and not capable of distinguishing. It also held that the word had come into general use in the trade. Now, when I read that part in the page 46 of 111, I was like, what? When I think of a polo trademark, I think of the fancy store in Santon in the V&A waterfront. I think of the clothing. I definitely don't think it's generic. Fortunately for us, the majority had a proper look at the case. They considered the hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of pages of evidence that was filed in support of the polo trademark, where we argued that because we've used the trademark for so long, it's become well known, it's become distinctive, it cannot possibly be removed on the basis of any of the grounds relied on by stable brands. The majority then considered the evidence, there's the minority, and they said that the evidence made four things clear, that there had been intensive and widespread and long-term use of the Polo trademark since 1976, that there had been significant financial investment in the trademarks, Many stores had been set up and considerable wholesale and retail infrastructure had also been set up. That the marks had generated significant amounts in net sales, 1.2 billion over three years. This was a clear indication that they had earned an immense goodwill and reputation. Finally, they found that the marks had become firmly established and had been operating as a badge of origin for 40 years. In light of the above, the SAA majority could, of course, not find that the trademarks were capable of removal on the basis that it become distinct, uh, incapable of distinguishing an indication of kind or customary in the trade. That deals with half of the kitchen sink. I hope you're still all with me. <laughs> um, the kitchen sink, you know, the, the half that we've dealt with is that it was a very long period. It took us five years to get a decision out of the Supreme Court of Appeal. 
that although it was an unpleasant experience for the legal team at times, the decision of the majority that our trademark, that the Polo trademark is well known and distinctive, is worth gold. I wouldn't suggest that we all go through that process to find it out, but if you do, it is an absolute amazing decision at the end. Now we've got to deal with section 271A and 271B. The high court and those minority judges found that despite all this evidence, despite all this well knownness, despite this 1.2 billion rand, that there hadn't been sufficient use of the trademarks and that no intention had been made to use all of them. And therefore, they removed all 46 trademark registrations on that basis. All 46. They didn't say, okay, maybe we use this one, maybe we use that one. No, all 46 went. Fortunately, the majority judgment, <laughs> having considered all the evidence, found that LA Group had used a majority of its trademarks, saved the registrations, and only removed a few. There were a few that hadn't been used and limited some registration to certain goods. So, for example, the registration in class nine covered a wide variety of goods. It's now been limited to inter alia sunglasses. Now we get to what was the interesting part of the judgment, section 1013. Section 1013 prohibits the registration of a trademark, which as a result of the manner in which it had been used, would be likely to cause deception or confusion. Both parties looked at the section and we both thought it meant very, very different things. <laughs> The debate between the parties was whether the section was limited or restricted to use by LA Group of its own trademark and whether that use had caused confusion or deception in the market, or whether in light of other external factors and comparisons, um, this is the counterparty's argument, you could remove the trademarks. The essence of Stable Brands' argument is that LA Group had used its Polo trademarks over the years alongside Ralph Lauren and caused confusion in the marketplace. Ralph Lauren, why are we talking about Ralph Lauren? <laughs> so let's just sketch a little bit of background. In the 1970s and the 1980s, there was a dispute between Ralph Lauren and LA Group about the Polo trademarks. They had a big bun fight, and then they sort of settled it on the basis that LA Group could use their Polo trademarks for goods in classes 25 and 18, so there's the handbag and the clothes, and that Ralph Lauren would use their trademarks for fragrances. So there you can see the Polo by Ralph Lauren, these, that's an important thing to note is the Ralph Lauren part in that box um, in class three. Stable brands argued that because the parties were coexisting that, and Alec Group had consented to Ralph Lauren using in South Africa, that there was confusion in the marketplace. They put forward some evidence of confusion in the marketplace, and they also complained that Alec Group had not tried to differentiate its product from that of Ralph Lauren. Now, LA Group had been trading for 30 years when Ralph Lauren came along in South Africa. Ralph Lauren used their trademark with the trademark Ralph Lauren. Somehow, LA Group was supposed to be the people that were supposed to differentiate their product. <laughs> LA Group's argument was that the inquiry into Section 1013 was limited. All you had to consider was how had they used their mark for the last 30 years, had that changed, and that you didn't have to consider external factors. You didn't have to consider Ralph Lauren. You didn't have to consider the coexistence with the alongside use with Ralph Lauren. That not, that's not what Section 1013 is about. And in support of our argument that Section 1013 was limited, we went to the UK. We're going to have a new prime minister that's 42. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we looked at that and said the UK has a similar provision called Section 461D. And that section says that all you look at is your own use. You do not consider other parties' use. The minority didn't like us. The minority judgment said, no, they don't think that section 461D and our section 1013 are equivalent. They said the wordings of the sections are different. Ours refers to confusion and deception. The UK section refers to conduct that is liable to mislead. They said that, that that mislead is very narrow and confusion and deception is broad enough to include comparisons with other people's trademarks, external factors in the market, and that our legislature never intended to limit Section 1013 to inquiry only to what is the actual trademark proprietor doing with its trademark to cause confusion in the marketplace, and that our legislature had intended for it to be far broader. Fortunately for us, the majority came to our rescue. <laughs> the majority agreed with our interpretation and said that if you want to do comparisons of trademarks, you must go to other sections in there. The sections 1014, 
the section 1015, we can do passing off. Section 1013 is not concerned with the comparison of your use with that of another third party. Furthermore, the majority said this evidence of alleged confusion, what evidence? There's no such evidence. This evidence constitutes hearsay and they rejected it. Therefore, the majority found on our in our favor, both in the law and on the facts. In conclusion, so Kimberly's question is, so what who cares? Um, <laughs> so as far as sections 10 to A and 27.1 A and B go, the laws remained unchanged. It's the same. There's nothing new about it. The matter turned on the facts. There was a 2,000, an excess of 2,000 pages of a record. So there you don't care. But where we do care, or perhaps only the lawyers in the room, is section 1013. Section 1013, the SCA has now provided an interpretation of the section that says the interpretation of it is narrow. You only look at what the actual proprietor has done, and you can't compare it to what other people have done. The other side being stable brands, they weren't happy. They apply to the constitutional court because that's what we all do Zuma style, run to the front court. The constitutional court refused their application for leave to appeal and said it did not engage the jurisdiction. No reasons are provided for the refusal. We can assume that the con court wasn't keen to read more than 2,000 pages of a record. And at the point of law, like most of you in this room, doesn't it's not of general public importance. It's section 1013 between trademark attorneys. So the horse was saved. We saved the day, the horses are saved, the whales are saved. Um, the end. Thank you so much, Alicia. I'm so relieved you got a win. And you're right, a win is a win. A win is a win. And uh, thankfully, the judges read the 2,000 page evidence. Oh my goodness. Um, and you come up came out victorious. Um, at this point, I will ask if there are any questions in the room for Alicia. There's one hand gone up. Where's my mic? Lindy, can you take the mic to that? That hand went up first. Okay, thanks, Lindy. Okay, while we wait for the, the microphone to get there, virtual audience, please jot down your questions as well on the chat. I am having a look. Thank you. Uh, hi, Alicia. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. That uh, that analysis was excellent. I just wanted to ask, um, in regard to the defence um, against the ten thirteen allegation. Yes. With the with the situation, this is what I've been wondering since I read the the judgment. Would the the situation have differed if the relationship between LA Group in South Africa and Ralph Lauren had instead of uh, a coexistence agreement? been concluded between them if it had instead been a licensing agreement in terms of say mm -hmm. either bare licensing or a non-exclusive license would that have caused the 1013 defense that was proffered to then have failed um i think your question is more if there was a bare license and then our registrations would have been attacked on the basis that we were granted a bare license but I don't think it would have engaged to use the gun board's word section 1013 i think the SCS define how that section should be interpreted to only be about how you, the actual proprietor, use your trademark. We might have had other issues on the basis that we had a bare license, and I think it wouldn't have been our trademark that would have been a problem. It would have been Ralph Lauren that had granted the bare license that would have faced problems um, with their registrations, but I think it wouldn't have mattered that the coexistence, whether it was a license agreement or not, it doesn't come into play in so far as section 1030 is concerned. Thank you. Thanks for that. I think we had another hand at the back, Lindy, in the room. Thank you. Um, Alicia, you mentioned that uh, this case has not affected the position in terms of sections 10.2 and 27. Can you explain how it changes the application of section 10.13 practically? Okay, guys, so we planted that question and we're hoping for the next slide. Ah. Um, <laughs> so previously, I had always thought in this case, so the sneaker on the black, um, in the black has the registered trademark called A1 Star. Uh, the other sneaker has the well-known Converse All-Star trademark. 
And before this decision, I had believed that we could make an argument that the manner in which that A1 star is used is likely to cause deception or confusion in the marketplace. Although their marks registered, they're very much trying to look like a North star. What this decision has now confirmed is that I can't do that. I can't rely on Section 1013 to get rid of that A1 star registration to say the manner in which you've used your mark would be likely to cause confusion or deception between those two sets of sneakers because you are deliberately using your mark to look like the Converse All-Star trademark. We would now have to find other grounds to remove the A1 star trademark and Section 1013 would not be applicable. Okay. Can I say something? Yeah. Uh, I think it's underplayed slightly that this is the first case, one of very, very few cases worldwide dealing with Section 1013 and its equivalent. So from a, a, a trademark nerd perspective and uh, <laughs> and and the world on the trademark level is pretty kind of connected. It's it's a South African decision that will be looked at in future by by other jurisdictions. So well done. Thanks. Well, thanks, Darren. Well done, Alicia. I just have one comment in the chat uh, from Brenda M saying, I like how Alicia broke down the case. So palatable and easy to understand. So much better from reading the 160 plus pages. Judgment. <laughs> Thank you and good job. Thanks, Alicia. Next up, we have Yanni. Yanni, are you talking about the hippo in the room? I am. I mm -hmm. am going to go straight at it. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Sticking with our theme of, of animals, I will be addressing the, the hippo in the room. So, uh, my talk today um, is actually a dispute that Adams and Adams was not involved in. It was a, a fight in the advertising sphere between Hippo and Outsurance, and we only weighed in a little bit later when the ARB complaint was was filed. For for those who have been uh, living under a rock the past couple of months. Right, so that is the outsurance advertisement. Next, we will have a, a look at what Hippo did. And just uh, you can see that at the time of preparing these slides, the Hippo ad had in excess of 1.7 million views. <laughs> okay, so Archurance, obviously upset about what had happened, <laughs> approached the High Court on an urgent basis. They had cited Telesure Investment Holdings and Hippo Comparative Services Company as the respondents in the proceedings. So just by way of background, and it will be relevant uh, a little bit later, Telesure is the holding company of a group of companies, including insurers and also Hippo. Hippo is, however, the company responsible for managing the insurance comparison platform. So the grounds on which our insurance approached the High Court was that the advert implies that they overcharged their clients, that they uh, cannot be trusted. Uh, they also argued that the advert constitutes an anti-competitive act, infringes common law and intellectual property rights, contravenes a number of codes of various financial bodies, and importantly, the ARB's code of advertising. The High Court dismissed the application on urgency and the advert continued to feature. Um, subsequent to that, Archurance approached the ARB and lodged a complaint with, with the regulatory body. The ARB is the advertising regulatory, regulatory body. Uh, the code provides various sections with which advertisements must comply. 
Uh, some of them include that an advertisement can't include misleading claims. It can't be disparaging of another advertiser's uh, advertisements. And in this regard, issues of substantiation and public interest are important, but we won't be focusing on that. Just as a matter of, uh, of interest, in one of HIPPO's printed ads, they refer to a study that was conducted between June and July in 2021, in terms of which 83% of consumers that used the platform saved in the region of 500 Rand. Just putting it out there. So turning now to uh, the clauses that, that we'll be discussing today is the exploitation of advertising goodwill and the clause providing that advertisement shouldn't imitate. Right. Exploitation of advertising goodwill. An advertisement may not take advantage of advertising goodwill relating to a trade name or symbol or advertising goodwill relating to another party's advertising campaign or advertising <coughs> property. The exception to this, and what makes this case interesting, is parody. What is parody? Something with uh, the intention to primarily amuse. I mean, when we started this uh, presentation, there were chuckles all around. Another important requirement is that, it, that the parody should not adversely affect the advertising goodwill of the advertiser to a material extent. That is also relevant. The factors that will be considered are likelihood of confusion and deception, elimination of the advertising goodwill. Um, the ARB will also consider whether the device or concept constitutes the signature of the product is consistently used, expended through media and prominent in the mind of the consumer. So we've referred to likelihood of deception or confusion in both the High Court proceedings and the ARB complaint. Um, Outsurance submitted uh, 70 posts from various social media platforms. And of all these posts, these were the three that we could find that actually alluded to confusion. First time I saw this ad, I laughed and called my partner to come and see. First thing he said was Outsurance, and then he saw the hippo. What hippo did to Outsurance on that ad is insane. Left me confused at first. I was so confused when I first, first saw it, even thought it was Outsurance. Of the 70 posts, these were the only three that referred to confusion, in addition to including all those emojis. Right, so let's say you overcome that hurdle. You can show that your advertisement is truly a parody. The intention was to amuse and that uh, there's no likelihood of deception or confusion. Now you need to cross or overcome the next hurdle, Clause 9, which provides that you are not allowed to imitate. What does that mean? that you cannot co copy an existing advertisement or any part thereof in a manner that is recognizable or clearly invokes the ex existing concept and which may result in the likely loss of potential advertising value. Deception or confusion is not required. These provisions apply for a period of two years, which will also become uh, relevant a little bit later. The factors that will be considered by the AOB in this regard is the extent of exposure, the period of usage and advertising spend, whether the concept is central, so we've heard that before, and the competitive sphere will also be taken into account. So as I mentioned initially, uh, the High Court proceedings were launched against Telesure and Hippo. Subsequently, when the matter was struck due to lack of urgency, the ARB complaint that was filed was only against Hippo. So bear in mind, Hippo is the company that runs the insurance comparison platform and it's not an insurer. They do not directly compete with insurance. So I love this, I love this slide because his face, Mr. Mabu's face on the right, just kind of, that's the face I get with when I walk around the corner, my kids stop doing something, then you know something's been wrong. So uh, this is just, it's quite obvious uh, when you have a look at this that, oh, right on cue, <laughs> that um, Hippo went to great lengths to make the connection with the insurance ad. But why would they do that? That is necessary for purposes of a parody. There has to be this link to the initial ad. So you have this scenario where um, uh, you 
you overcome clause eight, you can show that your your advertisement is a parody, but now you're stuck with the problem that you have imitated in order to to do so. So as far as as I'm aware, this is the only case, and unfortunately there was no outcome here, where these where parody was in fact at play and would have, I think, been the differentiation between the two clauses. So if you have to compare clause eight and clause nine, the differences, deception or confusion is relevant for clause eight when assessing whether the parody qualifies as an exception. There's no time period to consider. With clause nine, there is a deception or confusion is not relevant. There is a specific time period provided and the competitive sphere is relevant. The similarities, both clauses recognize an existing concept may not be taken advantage of, and both clauses require likely loss. So what we thought was quite interesting in determining whether the advertising goodwill was diminished or unfairly taken advantage of was the fact that um, in October 2020, our insurance had actually publicly distanced themselves from uh, Mr. Mabua as their spokesperson and publicly announced that they would be removing all advertisement featuring Katleho as soon as practically possible. So this, for me, is something different. It is not moving away from um, a theme or, uh, you know, updating your uh, advertisements. It is, it is an active step in distancing yourself from, from this central theme or concept that you, you had this advertising goodwill in. Uh, as I mentioned initially, the Hippos campaign was launched in August 2022, just within that two-year time period that I've referred to before. Would that have been relevant if the ARB had considered this complaint? <laughs> Another clicker. <laughs> yeah. Lisa, you've got the golden touch. Ah, it's wait, two four. No one. It's in the name. Yeah. Gosh, is that you? No, I think one back. Yeah, no, sorry, one forward. <laughs> I'll do the clicker. Ah, okay. So, um, uh, we saw earlier, and I referred to the 70 social media posts that were relied on in both in the in the High Court matter and the ARB complaint. For purposes of clause eight and nine, the, the uh, exploitation of advertising goodwill and imitation, this was the only evidence that was relied on to show damage or loss. Um, and, and that got me thinking, how would you quantify loss uh, in the advertising sphere? And um, after consultation, we understood that it is quite possible to very accurately determine um, the effect of online advertisements on premiums in the insurance industry. They can, in fact, track quite accurately uh, how an advertisement would uh, influence their you know, premiums, a sort of a return on, invest on investment exercise. And that's also possible not only for online advertising, but also in respect of radio and printed media spend. So you can really determine uh, what your return on investment is. None of this evidence was provided. Maybe it was so because an advertisement that had not been aired for almost two years, that sort of all trace was removed of, was now receiving um, traction again. Did this result in, in a loss? Those are the issues that we really would have liked the, the ARB to, to consider and, and rule on. Unfortunately, uh, that was not the case. Thank you. So why was the matter not decided on? Uh, subsequently, after the ARB was, uh, ARB complaint was filed, the uh, insurance withdrew their, their complaint. They also uh, withdrew the complaints with the different financial bodies. And as far as I'm aware, the High Court application has not moved forward at all. So these uh, interesting principles where we would certainly find the answers useful have not been decided on. So just in carrying with, on with uh, Kim's theme, what do we learn about this? If you want to be witty and if you are going to maybe do something tongue in cheek, 
in respect of those aspects that you can be sure of, for example, making the, the claims uh, that are capable of substantiation, have your evidence at hand. Know your strengths when you're going to do something like this. And then maybe the flip side of the coin, if you want to take action, because, you know, attack is the best defense, just make sure of your strategy. What would have happened if Outsurance perhaps approached the ARB first rather than the High Court? So those are basically my, my uh, thoughts about this uh, interesting advertising case where we had little skin in the game. A round of applause for Yanni, please. Thanks, Yanni. Now is the time for Q&A, but before we get there, I understand that our virtual audience couldn't hear the sound on the video. I relay our apologies for that. Um, our team has had a look at the issue, and I believe it's been resolved for further presentations going forward. So apologies once again that our virtual audience couldn't hear the sound on the videos. Um, and just a reminder again, our hashtag for today is Crema 2022. Fast on that phone, ne? please. Um, tweet and nice things only. Social media supported. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so we'll move on to the Q&A. Are there any questions for Yanni? for that case in the room. I'm also just monitoring the, the chat to see if there's any questions from our virtual audience. While you guys are thinking, I have a question, Yanni. Um, you told us a lot about what um, the complaint that was filed, but we don't know, did Hippo actually respond to the complaint or not? They did, and it was quite a short response <laughs> because uh, in terms of clause two of the advertising code, if a dispute is already pending before another uh, body or in the High Court, then the, the ARB shall not uh, consider the complaint. So it was a, as a two-liner. Okay. <laughs> they probably saved on legal fees there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and just one more question. You alluded to a trademark infringement claim. What, what would that pertain to? That was very interesting, and um, actually that would be an interesting topic for, for another session, perhaps. So, um, although it was not entirely clear in the High Court application, uh, they did, uh, Archons did allude to trademark infringement, and the trademark use that they were referring to was when Ms. Sparrow, after learning that she could have saved all this money, told uh, uh, the Katlejo lookalike to get out. Oh, okay. I think that is what they were referring to, although it was not very clearly argued in the in the papers. I, that may have been what they, they wanted to argue. That was actually, yeah, it's fine, I'll reserve my comment. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say anything anti. Trademark use. <laughs> well, thanks, Yanni. That was good. It was insightful. I think we will move on, because there are no questions or comments, to you, Verena. You'll take us through the blind essay case. Over to you. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for your time again. Uh, we joked quite a lot about addressing the hippo, in, uh, the, the elephant in the room. So I just want to do that real quickly. I got the memo about the animals. I did not get the memo about the green dress. <laughs> <laughs> I was left of, of that WhatsApp group. Nor did I. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Darren. <laughs> uh, and um, Alicia, a case uh, doing it zoom out style. I'm going to just briefly run you through the recent judgment um, from the Constitutional Court in which it held our Copyright Act to be unconstitutional, which is a pretty serious uh, thing, right? Because that means our Copyright Act fell short of um, upholding constitutional values and it even infringed basic human rights. Um, this case really arose because of government's delayed reform process, which involves, as some of you may know, the Copyright Amendment Bill. And interestingly, the court was faced with a scenario where all the parties really sought the same outcome in principle. It was just the mechanism through which that outcome had to be achieved that was the subject of the debate. So I will take you through the opposite views and then really how the court found balance. So um, at the risk of being too academic, um, I looked for some visuals to add to my presentation today, and I came across this children's book titled Just a Little Bit, and it's all about finding balance. 
So it resonated and I decided to, to borrow from it. And the story starts here where the animals all want to play. So elephant gets on the seesaw and obviously creates an imbalance. Um, mouse climbs to the very edge of the upside and nothing happens. In this illustration, um, elephant would be the copyright act. Um, it has created a really awkward imbalance uh, through no fault of its own and mouse would be blind SA. Now that is the organi organization that brought this case uh, before the constitutional court. It is a local organization that advocates for the rights of the blind in our country. And mouse desperately wanted to reinstate balance, but as we will see, it could not do that alone. But before we delve into the details, I want to give some context to the imbalance that we are speaking about. And I brought along some stats, which I got from the World Blind Union, and according to its information, only 10% of content that has been published globally is accessible to visually impaired or otherwise print disabled people. In South Africa, that figure drops to below 0.5%. And sticking to South Africa, 32% of all disabilities in our country relate to a visual disability. That is more than a third of all disabilities in this country. And of those, 97% are unemployed. So that, that is some staggering statistics that really shows the concern um, uh, and the impact of the inaccessibility of published material to the visually impaired. Why this is so? Um, naturally, a person that is visually impaired cannot engage with published material in the same way that someone who does not have that disability can. The published material first has to be converted into a format that is accessible. Uh, for instance, a braille copy or an audio book. Now, making those conversions is not easy and neither is it cheap. So you will see that publishers tend not to publish in those formats for those very reasons. Um, but there's a second problem, and that is that making those conversions requires the consent of the owner of the copyright that vests in that material. Without the consent of the copyright owner, making a conversion of that nature amounts to copyright infringement. So let's bring that down to a practical example. And we think uh, of a student who receives material, study material at the same time as his or her classmates. We're talking textbooks, question and answer sheets, PDF documents, whatever the case may be. That student cannot engage with that material. Um, he or she first needs to find a way to convert find funds to convert or find an organization that can help with those conversions. But then there's a second hurdle in that even if that capability exists and there is access to it, um, the copyright consent issue still needs to be addressed in order to avoid an infringement. And that is where the Copyright Act fell short in not providing an exception to address those concerns and allowing disabled, visually disabled people to make those conversions without having to overcome the second hurdle. Now, the fact that the Copyright Act had this shortcoming was never an issue. Uh, it's not contentious at all. In fact, the Copyright Amendment Bill set out to address this by including an exception that would provide uh, for the making of, uh, we call it accessible format copies. Um, However, our first problem is that the Copyright Amendment Bill has been stuck in the process for what was it, between five and seven years. And in that time, there has still not been any reprieve for the blind. And this is where Blind SA, uh, Blind SA's hand was really forced in starting to take action and doing things or doing something to try and, and, and help the process along. And Blind SA therefore launched the application in which it sought two things. The first is a declaration that the Copyright Act is unconstitutional for not including an exception of this nature. And secondly, Blind SA asked for the reading in of section 19D of the Copyright Amendment Bill. Now that is the section that would provide for the exception, reading that into our Copyright Act. What Blind SA's case did not fully consider was the fact that the section 19D as it was drafted um, was, was faulty. It was insufficient and it could not achieve the goal that Blind SA had wanted to achieve. And so this is where the role of the AMI key becomes relevant. And 
Uh, firstly, there were several amici that joined the proceedings. So on my illustration, this would be all of the animals jumping on the other side of the seesaw in an attempt to tip it back into, um, into balance. However, a dispute arose about how exactly to address the defect in the act. And it was really the arguments by the first amicus that were instrumental in this regard. The first amicus, uh, contrary to Blind SA, uh, argued firstly that the Constitutional Act, uh, the Copyright Act, sorry, is not unconstitutional for not including the exception. And that is because the Copyright Act uh, empowers the minister to make regulations through which an exception can be implemented and in fact can be implemented immediately. The first amicus even provided wording for a draft regulation and for what uh, an exception of that nature would look like. Secondly, and more importantly, that section 19D is insufficient and reading it in would not be an uh, appropriate remedy. The reason for that is the section 19D as it was worded lacked definitions that would make it intelligible. You could not interpret 19D if you tried. Um, it was far too wide, it was ambiguous, and it did not comply with the Marrakesh Treaty. Um, inter uh, which, after careful consideration of the uh, provisions of the Copyright Act, came, in my view, to um, an inevitable conclusion, really, that the Copyright Act is unconstitutional for limiting access by blind and visually impaired people to works, um, you know, that, that where, where people without those disabilities are not limited at all. Um, in that finding, the Constitutional Court agreed with Blind SA that the Copyright Act is unconstitutional. It disagreed with the first amicus that the defect could be addressed by leaving it to the minister to regulate the issue. However, in addressing the mechanism through which the defect should be corrected, the Constitutional Court disagreed with Blind SA um, and agreed with the first amicus in finding that Section 19D is insufficient, it is flawed, it is not fit for purpose. Um, it also did not fit in with the case that was pleaded by Blind SA. And so the court did not uh, agree or was not willing to read in Section 19D. Instead, it crafted a bespoke um, section, which is now 13A, and which contains a suitable exception. I'm not going to deal with the exception in any detail, but if you look at it, you will see that in as much as it allows the making of accessible format copies, there are definite boundaries to the exception. Um, you know, who may benefit from the exception, who is allowed to make these accessible format copies, which works may be the subject of accessible format copies, and in what circumstances. For instance, it requires that there must have been lawful access to the work in the first place, um, and it must take place in a non-profit environment. The court also ordered Parliament to correct or cure the defect within a period of 24 months, and during that time, Section 13A will be read in to the Copyright Act. So what we have at the end of the day is the Constitutional Court did tip the seesaw back into balance, um, for a period of 24 months. And during that time, we have Section 13A, and we will have to turn our eyes back to the process involving the Copyright Amendment Bill and see how that in unfolds. Um, I was thinking about a, a takeout, um, you know, so what? Um, for me, for me, this case really illustrated that if there was any doubt still that the provisions of the Copyright Amendment Bill as they were drafted, um, are not, at least not all, fit for purpose. Uh, I don't think following the judgment and the outcome here, there can be any doubt about that anymore. And should those provisions be included in our Act as is, it will probably open up the Copyright Act to more constitutional challenges in future, meaning it does not end here and uh, Elephant may be back in the Concord again. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Verena. That was good. Very, very good. Um, <laughs> just checking in the room if we have any questions for Verena. Yes, we've got one from Dr. Gavin. Can we get a, a mic on, on to him, please? 
Thanks, Lindy. Thank you. Um, so the optics would look really bad if, uh, you know, the, the blind people created these documents and then the, the publishers sued them for copyright infringement. I mean, it just, would just be a horrific case of, um, you know, uh, discriminating against people with disabilities. Is it not just worth taking a risk then to, to kind of create these materials knowing that no one's ever going to really uh, push back? Thank you for the question. Um... <laughs> Careful, Verena. <laughs> Who am I acting for? <laughs> um, no, uh, in all seriousness, I think I think where the danger lies is that it's not necessarily the student by him or herself creating these materials. I think you're very right. You say, um, you know, if, if it had to take place in that environment only, um, you know, take a chance, who will know? And certainly it will look very bad for a publisher to come after a student. However, you know, practically the student doesn't necessarily have those abilities. Um, and therefore it would be some organization or some institution that would be doing this on a, on a, on a big scale that then does start to, you know, in terms of we have this legislation, this is what the law currently says, you know, in terms of right and wrong, that's where you're going to land up. Um, and do you then really want to incur that risk, in, you know, just the pure risk of litigation and the costs and the fighting and the media and everything that goes with it? Um, because the publishers, in, in, in that scenario, the publishers would still well be within their rights um, to institute that action. And so I think it is, the exception is just, um, you know, right on the money. It should be there. Um, and publishers, I worked with publishers, received publish, uh, commentary from publishers during the course of this case, and they supported that. Um, you know, it, it also creates or, or brings certainty for them. I hope that answers your question. Good question. Thanks, Verena. I think I want to read one or two comments from the chat. Shanine says, I would like to express my thanks to all of the speakers. I am thoroughly enjoying the case law reviews. IP is my passion in law and I'm absorbing every word. Um, Nokolo says, very insightful session. Thank you all for this, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and I think I just want to pose one more question to you, Verena. What is the impact of this case? Will it cause any further delay to the finalization of the copyright amendment bill? Will it ever be finalized? I mean, <laughs> well, that is a good question. <laughs> uh, Lisa, I don't know. Um, not necessarily. There's no obligation on Parliament to take or the government to take the Copyright Amendment Bill back. So it has passed through the House of Assembly. It's on its way to the National Council of Provinces. If it is passed, it will go to the president. president. Um, now, the current bill still has a Section 19D, slightly amended, but still very much concerns around the current wording of 19D. The practical thing to do would be to take the bill back, consider the judgment, and perhaps consider applying the wording carved out in, in the now Section 13A. But as I say, there's no obligation on Parliament to do so. If the state's advisors feel that what they have in 19D currently addresses the um, shortcomings highlighted by the judgment and sufficiently uh, you know, caters for the exception required, then they can push ahead with what they've got. Um, in which case the process should continue. Okay, thanks, Verena. Just one more um, comment. I just don't have the person's name. It says, this case is certainly of great interest to me and thank you for this informative session. Okay, I'll, I'll hold it there for now. Dan, I know you've been dying to say something. Now's your chance. <laughs> I brought something. <sentiment. laughs> Over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Verena. Um, do you mind if I stand? Just from an optics point of view, I feel that there's a bit of visual impairment over here <laughs> behind this lectern, and I, I also thought it would be appropriate. Being the only boy at the bar, I should, I should probably, <laughs> I should probably own it. Um, I've avoided using uh, a picture of a chicken, uh, and I know that's <laughs> tantalising for the break in ten minutes. I'm going to ask you just to hang on for ten minutes while I get through three quick cases um, about Chicken Licken's attempt to to protect their soul trademark, soul food. Um, right, I'm going to jump right in. <clears throat> so there are three different cases in recent times, one to this year, one in 2019. Uh, three different courts in South Africa, one in Gauteng, um, one in the Western Cape, and one in uh, KwaZulu-Natal. 
one identical claim of that of being of trademark infringement relating to the word soul. Uh, one result, no infringement in all three cases. Um, in my opinion, all legally, inc legally incorrect. I'm not sure to persuade you of that, but I will just touch on it. Um, and then I, the reflection is how in the face of these cases, how does one have things changed in the way we have which approach trademark infringement claims in South Africa, if we just look at these judgments. So just to take you back to some concepts about trademark law, imagine that as your brand, you're investing a lot of money in it, and it's growing, right? All your goodwill, your, your investment, you're building your brand. And the protection afforded to you un, in an unregistered rights environment is limited to exactly where you build your brand and where you can sow a likelihood of confusion. So it's limited geographically, and it's limited to the type of business that you operate in. So if you're chicken licking, you're operating a fast food outlet, it's somewhat limited to a fast food outlet. The trademark registration process, what that does is it enables you to create a barrier around your, your brand, right? And through a registration of a trademark, you can go, provided you've got an intention to use and provided you've got a budget to secure these registrations, you can create a barrier to prevent these guys from coming in. Right. And obviously, the wider the barrier, the more valuable the trademark, the easier it is to protect the core. But you've got to realize, as uh, Alicia's case identifies, is that there are things, there are challenges to that trademark. So one is an expense thing. The other is you've got to be able to use it every five years. You've got to be show use of the trademark. And if you build your, your house, your brand on weak trademarks, descriptive trademarks, if you build them out of sand, you know, it can collapse if if you can get them, if they declared invalid for lack of descriptive, you know, for lack of distinctiveness, et cetera. So those are the basic concepts relating to trademark law. Applied to these three cases, you've got chicken licken, and I'm not looking at the major brand, I'm really looking at, at the sole food underneath, the comfort food, the sole trademark that they that they use quite a lot. Um, and to those overseas, of course, chicken licken is a big competitor to Kentucky Fried Chicken, our local equivalent. So if you, you put it in that context, it would be the same as Kentucky Fried Chicken's sub-brand of soul food. And they've got a registration soul, which you would expect to get, class 43, covering restaurants, snack bars, cafes, fast food outlets, canteens, et cetera. They've got a whole number of these trademarks, but this is the most important one. And you can see immediately that the barrier is slightly wider, slightly, first of all, it's a national right, and secondly, it's wider than just a fast food chicken outlet. And then come Sol Souflaki, a Greek food restaurant. Oma Sol, a vegan re restaurant. And Sol Kitchen, much loved for those who go to Bettenberg Bay, right? They enter the property, so to speak. And I should just mention <clears throat> that neither of them, or none of them, except for Sol Souflaki, raise any problems relating to Sol as a trademark as a counterclaim, in particular that perhaps Seoul should never have been registered in the first place because it really just describes comfort food, right? But I'm not going to linger too much on that. If they did raise it, the judge really just didn't make a finding that any of those uh, were just, you know, dismissed the counterclaim. And then the comparison, so those three incumbents at the bottom, that's 2019, 2020, 2021. The chap at the top there, Salsa, is one in Melville in 2009, which they successfully kicked out the ring, right? They found that Salsa was too close to Seoul, and as a result, they were infringing, and they left the room, right? And I think you'll agree, just on the, an analysis there, if you were to compare those trademarks, Salsa is probably the least similar to any of the others. Okay, so just bear that in mind. So what's changed in in 2022. These are the headlines. Vegan Cafe wins, branding battle against Chicken Lincoln, Chicken Licking an illegal flap, accused of aggressive litigation, and Chicken Lickers feather, Feathers ruffled as Pettenberg Bay restaurant outsmarts, outsmarts its sole kitchen uh, trademark. Negative PR, not good for the brand, and three losses in a row. So what went wrong for Seoul? Right, no trademark infringement. And if I had to just distill reading, really, I think not certainly not 121 pages of, of cumulative pages of judgment, very short judgments, the judges have made mistakes in conflating the issue of passing off when you're looking at what the actual restaurant does versus the ring around it, which is really what they should be confining their, their, their analysis to. So 
there's conflation of issues, there's confusion amongst the judge and how to apply the test, right? And what they're thinking in their mind is that it, it's not equitable for me to give rights to a fast food outlet when the person's selling Greek food. Right. So that's what's happening in, in the judgments. And we talk about how we prevent that from happening. You get a feeling that this type of bullying behavior, that this chicken licking, which is legal, here locally, a big brand, is coming in as a big guy going after small businesses, and you feel that there's pushback, social pushback from the judges. And even in one of the cases, in the, in the Natal case, they talk about the concept of Ubuntu, that really you shouldn't be seeing big corporates bashing small businesses around, and it should be allowing them in to use their brands. Now, again, if I just have to say, there's a, yes, there's a, a need to improve small businesses, but they're also, they're, they're fundamental public policy reasons for trademark infringement, and that is to prevent confusion. So, you, you, but you get a sense that the hippo is somewhere up there and we're battling down on the right-hand side to use your analogy. And I think there are some lessons to be learned because in, in how to approach these cases going forward, how do we avoid these decisions? And it's quite a wordy slide, but if you just bear with me. So I think the lesson, if businesses are different, I think when you plead passing off in trademark infringement, try and get away from the, the, the reputational aspects. Just strictly plead trademark infringement because it will reduce the likelihood of that judge being confused. It does that. It leads to conflation if you don't. And of course, it's cheaper because if you have to show reputation, you have to prove evidence to show that reputation. So it's cheaper to run anyway. So I would be an advocate of being much more simple in the pleadings. And that goes on to the second one is to use this, the European step-by-step -step approach for pleading trademark infringement. And the reason for that is that the European approach has been harmonized to cater for laws in 28, now 27 member states. And as a result, it's really dumbed it down. Okay, so it's done down the whole test. And what it allows is for headings and an analysis under each heading. Heading, analysis, you'll see in the next slide how it's done, analysis heading, which means that there's less likely for a judge who doesn't deal with trademark law all the time to become confused. And also, if you ever take the, the case on appeal, you can identify quite clearly where the error or where you believe the error might have been made. I think when you be, you've got to be firm in protecting your rights, but you've got to be less aggressive, right? You've, you've got to come across as you're educating, you've got to understand and to some extent empathize with your opponent. Not all of these businesses are trying to get onto your, your turf, right? I put the crook there, just tongue in cheek, but really some, most of these cases, they're not trying to take uh, the, the, the reputation that you've garnered in Seoul. Of course, you may think differently, but you've got to look at it through the eyes of the judge. And I think it has PR, it's got PR, positive PR effects, because anything you write in a letter of demand, of course, can be reproduced in a touch of a button onto social media. And you've got to just be aware of that, I think, when you're drafting these things. I think you've got to invest in educating, taking the judge along. And I think you've got to choose counsel quite carefully. So you've got to be representative. I think you've got to match. Don't go in with senior counsel when your small business owners can only afford junior counsel. Right. Be aware of color. And also choose counsel who is likely to dumb it down, to really use simple, basic language to persuade the judge. And really, I do, I'm a big advocate of this, is using the step-by-step -step approach. Because what had happened, we use a slightly different case. It feels awkward to them. It just doesn't feel right. And what happens is that they migrate to, the, to this global appreciation test, which leads to conflation. So what I talk about, this is my last slide, step-by-step -step approach, just very carefully. If you look at the top, I've outlined what this might look like in a step-by-step -step environment. You've got the three cases and the facts at the top. And on the left-hand side there, you've got the test application. Those are the headings I'd love to see in pleadings. Are the marks identity or similarity of services or goods? So in this case, it's identical. Restaurant services covers Greek food services, covers vegan cafes, covers a bistro, right? So they're identical. There's no question there. Very difficult for the judge to get that wrong if you plead it like that. The second is then you talk about the similarity of the trademark. Now, each one of them has got soul in it. Soul is not lost within that mark, which potentially is with salsa. It's 
fairly independent distinctive character in that mark, in my opinion, that would render the mark either highly similar or medium high similarity. You make it, you make a judgment at that point as to how similar that mark is. The ordinary consumer, everyone buys uh, out of out of restaurants or, or eateries, even from a spas shop on the side of the road. The strength of the registered mark, of course, I don't think Seoul is particularly strong, although they've got they've got use of it. You can even put in there ordinary, or you probably if you're pleading for them, you'd say an ordinary mark. And I think if you put that together and that likelihood of con confusion at the bottom is you've got to then weigh up all those factors and make a value judgment. And I think if you do it like that, you're less likely get into trouble with conflation and, and confusion by judges in these types of cases. At the bottom, that's just the test application when you plead dilution. Don't plead dilution if you don't have a proper reputation in your trademark because it's going to lead to confusion with the judge. Right. So keep it out. Aim the arrow, aim it sharp, and uh, I think you're likely to be more successful going forward. And that's it for me. Thanks so much, Darren. All that talk about fried chicken got me hungry. <laughs> Um, but we're nearing our break. Um, before we get there, though, are there any questions for Darren for the soul cases? Oh, yes, we've got a hand. Thanks, Lindy. Oh, good morning. Uh, thanks, Darren, for that lovely presentation. Uh, I just wanted to know if have any of the three cases uh, been taken in appeal and none so far I'm as aware. So um, the the one was decided, the la latest one was decided in March, um, but these things take time, as you know. So it, it's not clear, and I haven't spoken to the attorney who, who ran the cases, but uh, they obviously got a got a bollocking in the press, and I, I think they may have they may have lost their soul. But um, who knows? It's a good question. I, I don't actually know. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. Any other questions? Okay, no questions in the room. We've got a comment in the virtual chat. Thanks, Darren, for the presentation. Like the step-to-step -step approach. That is from Yande. Darren, I have a question for you. Um, what does this case now, in fact, these cases, what do they mean for brand holders? Is it still worth it to rush to court to, to enforce your rights? Yeah, so I think, I mean, when you read these cases, why the hell am I going to go and register my trademarks, right? So I think... You know, the trademark has a real value to it in the sense of it does create that barrier. It's a deterrent risk when you're coming in. Um, it's illegal. You can transfer it. You can license it more easily. So I think this case shouldn't deter uh, brand owners from enforcing their trademarks. I think you just got to be a bit smarter about it. Uh, it's also something to bear in mind that 75% of cases decided at the first level instance get overturned on appeal mm -hmm. and not by a three to two advantage. So so I think you really, you, the the with all due respect to the courts, the, the 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 understanding at the top level is better than understanding at lower courts. You really have to dumb it down um, and just go to court. And and it should make it cheaper because you, you really are just using your trademark registration certificate. Awesome. Thank you, Darren. Any other comments, questions? Going, going, gone. Okay. Thanks. You can, you can take your seat, dear. <laughs> I know you want to stand here. Just sit there. I must be careful here. I do work with him. <laughs> Um, yes, so just one more comment from Ayokunle. He says, Yande, I agree with the way fast food businesses are springing up in Nigeria. This will likely have similar versions in Nigeria too. Nice presentation and analysis too. Um, and I, you know, I think I'll leave it there. You guys have done a great job um, of taking very technical cases um, and making them relatable and using friendly language. Um, so thanks for that. A round of applause for... Thank you.